You're listening to another episode of the Anavivo podcast. Thank you for your time. I'm a riffer, bro. Riffer Riff, and you didn't know it. Riffer, riffing back and forth right here on the podcast. I can imagine this is the uh, soundtrack that Jimmy Fallon comes into and his band like plays as they're going, and they're like, Jimmy Fallon, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Except in this case, it's the standalone default music that came with my Rodecaster Pro 2. Thank you, Rode. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Anavivo podcast. I am your host, Tim C. Miller, beautiful Woodby Island location for the audio recording today. And I am joined by none other than Sizzly Steve. So Stephen is my brother, for those of you who didn't know. And uh, we are the bookend bros. Bookend bros. Bookend bros. (laughs) We've got three other brothers in between us. And Stephen and I work together for... um, uh, for ourselves as a real estate strategist and consultants nationwide. Um, I'm a managing broker at Compass, which is the uh, largest real estate company in the United States by volume, and um, and just took over a couple of years ago, took over that number one position in the state of Washington here as well. So, so I represent clients across the nation consulting for free. If you ever are moving, uh, looking to buy, sell, or um, just need general real estate advice, I get paid by other agents, okay? So so you guys can call me anytime and uh, just talk about your plans or thoughts or run an idea by us. And, um, and then if you need help with a uh, local source there in Kentucky or wherever you are, um, we will refer you there to the one of the best brokers there. Yeah, so. no cost of your own. Or... If you want to be our next guest on the podcast. Oh, yeah. Invitation. Yeah, we would love Join to us hear on your stories. The show. So so today we are going to be discussing some travel stories. This is a short uh, Stephen is going to share, and then I'm going to share. And uh, this one is purely for entertainment purposes. Uh, just some memories. And I think the impetus behind it for me, at least, is to share with you all, listeners, that um, that getting Having a why, being able to articulate and identify your why for existence is important. And um, and so one of my whys is to be able to travel. I love traveling and I love um, I love the just the downtime that comes with a vacation and being able to uh, turn off the work mentality and really uh, um, spend time with the people that I'm more heavily invested with. So in this case, uh, my family. So um I'm going to kick it off here to Stephen to share a little bit about his why and uh, one of his most favorite travel stories or, or memories um, for him. So without further ado, Sizzly Steve. Yeah. So <clears throat> I've been blessed by God to have um, a grotesquely amount of free time. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting word choice. <laughs> Grotesquely amount of free time. No human you should do. have this much free time. You do have a lot of free time. <laughs> so, um, no human should. Have. I've been blessed by God to get all this free time, and, and by you, my business partner. Um, not only with the work that we do that gives me all this free time, but you own some timeshares mm. that. Um, that theoretically, in any other scenario, would be a money pit. <laughs> would be a money pit, but because you have so many family members, it's a huge blessing to uh, our family to be able to be invited on all these vacations. One of these vacations was not one that you invited us on, but it was a family Christmas vacation. So mm. the way that our Christmases work is three out of the five brothers are married, mm-hmm. and every other Thank year, you, Lord. <laughs> every other year, the married. Uh, brothers leave and depart the nest and go to their spouses for leave and cleave on the odd years Uh, leave and cleave on the odd years um roost and boost on the even years (laughs) (laughs) so this happened to be an even year christmas 2021 Mm. and so i knew everyone was going to be home all my brothers which 
is always exciting. Everyone wants to spend Christmas with Wait, their I, family. Wait, I had that wrong. I'm sorry. It's leaving Cleve on the on the even years because there's there's odd number of us bros, five bros, and so we roost and boost on the odd years. Yeah. So this year, this particular episode is being recorded in 2023. This will be a roost and, and boost. And so this is a roost and boost year. Yeah. Well, yeah. last year actually happened to be a roost and boost. Not to detour a little bit, <laughs> but because you guys ended your leave and cleave so early. <laughs> <laughs> did, did we? Yeah, that okay. you returned and, ho- home for in time for Christmas, Christmas, or oh, like the afternoon okay. of Christmas, or something. yeah, yeah. Anyway, anyways, anyways. So, um, twenty twenty one. The year is twenty twenty one. Oh, it's Halloween. Oh, Halloween. Ben and I live together, and I have run out of things to watch, <laughs> and so. <laughs> In my due diligence, I was. Uh, is that ever a problem for? Us? <laughs> yes, it is. First when world you problems have grotesquely here, amount of free time. <laughs> grotesque amount of free time. Um, you run out of things to watch, and so I was hooked on Top Gear because British humor is uh, intriguing for me. <laughs> it's a case study, <laughs> and I discovered the show called Taskmaster, and it's ah. this British uh, game show where they invite five comedians. Okay. to partake in this game show. And they split them up. They film the episode. Um, each contestant is individual by themselves with a host. Mm. And the host gives them an envelope with a task on it. And he doesn't answer any of their questions about how to do the task or anything. He just lets them succeed or fail on their own. <laughs> and it's hilarious to watch. And so I got addicted to this. I binged as many seasons as I could find mm. because it's not available anymore. And uh, and I got addicted to it, and I said, you know what? All my brothers are coming home for Christmas. Let me set up my own version of Taskmaster mm-hmm. for Christmas. And so that's what mm-hmm. I did. So I went to town making these envelopes uh, with letters and tasks on them and then scheduling time with each of my brother's families mm-hmm. and my parents to individually film them performing these 10 <laughs> tasks. And that happened throughout Christmas. And then um, we finished in January, I think, right after Christmas. Mm -hmm. And I put them all up on YouTube. And uh, it was fun. It was. It was a lot of fun. It was a really creative Christmas gift to us that was interactive, got us laughing, got us together to do stuff together as a family. Yeah, everybody loves to compete. (laughs) And, and, uh, yeah, there was some competition involved, but also there was a lot of work. I mean, you you built all the tasks and came up with all the ideas, but then – you're also your own film crew, and then you're also your own editing crew, yeah. And you're the own, you're your own host. So there's a lot that went involved. You know, I, I'm asking you questions about the rules as you're attempting to film it, as you're thinking down the road. <laughs> I've got to edit this out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was it was many many days of work, but it was so fun because I get to I know in my mind how I would do the task. <laughs> Because you know what the expectation is. The rest of us are like, what does this mean? Turn the turn the arrow this way. Can I use an icicle yeah. to find my true north? <laughs> and and the fun part is you don't get to see what the other brothers are doing. And, right. Until, until it's all over. Until it's filmed, yeah. And yeah, so cool. you think you might have like the most intuitive way to do it. I got it. it. And then you see someone else. So um, <laughs> one of my favorite tasks... Uh, well, let's just talk about the way that they were interpreted. So you, you didn't get to see how they were done until it was all done. One of the tasks was throw a tea bag. Let me read it here. Throw a tea bag into a mug from the furthest distance. Mm-hmm. You have 30 minutes. You may start when Stephen asks, are you sweaty? <laughs> are you sweaty? So what they would do is they would read that, and then I would immediately ask, are you sweaty, and start the time. So, And um, as an analyst, I would continue to ask questions until my <laughs> – Yes. The questions were solved. And the only answer I would ever give is all the questions are, all all the information is in the task and disputes will be determined at the time mm-hmm. of scoring. So I would never help anyone. But uh, they all figured out a way to, with their spouse or their team partner or whatever, stand far apart and throw a tea bag into a mug. Mm. And I think you guys were getting up to like 90 inches, 150 inches. Mm-hmm. Nate and Sarah got it pretty far. They attached it to like some tennis balls and were throwing it into a funnel that ended up in the mug. Oh, cool. So they got pretty far. But then dad and mom, and of course no one knows this until... till the end when we're watching it. till yeah. everyone's watching it together. Dad and mom read the task, throw a teabag into a mug from the furthest distance, and, deter- and interpret it as drive away really far and then throw a teabag into a mug. And so they drew drove for... 
you know, a mile away and then threw it in. And I'm sitting there the entire time thinking like, okay, is this, is this even allowed? Is this allowed? Like I am the taskmaster. <laughs> what are the rules here? So I sent this to an English teacher and asked them <laughs> and they said, how would you interpret this? <laughs> it can be interpreted both ways. Both ways are fine. And so they ended up winning that one. And wow. I think to everyone's chagrin, they're like, that's not fair. Yeah. That's not fair. Because none of us, because the majority interpretation would have held that that read, re- read it again word for word. Throw a tea bag into a mug from the furthest distance. So anyone hearing that right now and then us reading that would, I think the majority would say, throw the tea bag into a mug from the furthest distance. Not drive away somewhere as far as not go a certain distance and then drop the tea bag in the mug or throw it in the mug. So it's inch. So there was, yeah, like you said, it was, it could be interpreted both ways. Yeah. Um, and, and you don't really think about the other and way. We never really are thinking creatively enough like that. However, there was one, I don't know if you're going to talk about it, the bubble one that Ben did. Are yeah. you talking about that? Oh yeah. Yeah. So yeah. another misinterpretation. <laughs> well, no, I thought that was clever because I, I didn't think about that at all. And Ben did a great job. Although, I think he just went in circles, and Seth and Becky went up the hill. Seth and Becky got in the car. Yeah, got in their car with the bubble still yeah, on the stick. Yeah, still on the stick. So the other one was that he's talking about here is um, blow a bubble in this room. Transport that bubble furthest from this room. Furthest distance from the room wins. You have 10 minutes. You may start when Stephen asks, are you confetti? So I... Are you confetti? Set up the task so that you would start in an upstairs bedroom in mom and dad's house. Mm-hmm. Everyone starts in the same bedroom. You blow a bubble in that room, and you have to transport it without it popping the furthest distance from the room. Right. Most people interpreted that task the way I wrote the task. Logically. Logically. As, as we all should. Which is always <laughs> fun to see how people don't interpret the task correctly. <laughs> ben interpreted it as travel the furthest distance with this bubble. And so he blew a bubble and then proceeded to go downstairs and walk in circles. But he, he blew the bubble and left it on the end of his stick oh. and carried that stick around versus like so the way that the most of us interpreted it was Take blow the, the bubble. We blew the bubble and then we're like blowing the bubble that's in the air now over the staircase, trying to get it as far away as possible. That's not true, actually. You are the only group that tried to actively Blow, blow the, the bubble. bubble around. Oh, everybody else left it on Most the stick. people caught it with the stick. Oh, okay. <laughs> so like, and yeah, and then Seth and Becky's case, they put it on their stick and got in there, went out to their car and yeah. drove away. <laughs> so what Ben did was he didn't even use the stick. He took a paper towel roll mm. and put a towel over it, soaked it in the bubble solution and started blowing a bunch of thousands of little bubbles onto okay. the towel. Yeah, smart. So that it wouldn't, you know, he'd always have a bubble. But then he proceeded to just walk in circles and never made it any further from he the room. He walked the farthest dis- He walked the most steps. The most steps in distance, but not the farthest from that room. He managed yeah. to stay the closest to the room. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was a fun one. My my favorite task of all, though, was we we ended Christmas in Leavenworth. We went to mm. a giant- not the prison for those of you that don't know. Where we live, <laughs> oh, Leaven- Leavenworth, Washington, uh, <laughs> east side of Washington. It's a it's a beautiful Bavarian town up in the Cascade foothills that uh, that looks like a scene out of Sound of Music. And yeah, they host a, a an amazing Christmas party there every year with a million plus lights lighting up of Leavenworth and um, yummy brats and beer and pretzels and just delicious and snow and yeah, it's just a pretty yeah. yeah. Just being in the town any time of year. Is pretty magical. Is like, wow, this is the whole town is. I mean, even the Safeway is like Bavarian styled. Bavarian styled. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, a really cool Christmas town. Um, so we got a giant cabin there with like 15 rooms or something crazy. Um, and the very last task I gave was, um, let me read it here orientate the arrow on the back of this task to true north. Hmm. You may not leave this room. You may not use any electronics. Weigh down this paper with something heavy when you're finished. You may start when Stephen asks, are you Lewis and Clark? Are you Lewis and Clark? So he had an arrow that was on the task paper that he handed us, and we and our job was to, in our mind, figure out, or whatever we had in that room that wasn't electronic, figure out where True North was and point that arrow towards True North and then weigh it down. And I put everyone up in my room that I was staying in, and it was like 8 p.m., pitch, mm-hmm. pitch black out. Right. You couldn't sell, see the sun or the stars. There was too many trees around. We had just arrived like the day before, so no one really knew how we pulled in or which way the building is facing. 
we hadn't really orientated ourselves at all. So it was a perfect task right off the bat. Throw you in a dark room with <laughs> with one, two windows, or whatever. And it's just fun to see who knows where True North is. And at dinner, before we even did the task, um, Seth says something ironic and says, uh, let me see where I can find it. He said this before the tasker? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So before I even tell anyone what the task is, mm-hmm. I haven't brought anyone up to the room to do it yet we're eating dinner and Seth says if you drop me off in the middle of the woods at night blindfolded I could tell you where north is <laughs> and I'm like dying inside laughing because I'm about to send him upstairs and ask him that question <laughs> and of course everyone gets up there and they're all off by north and dad except gets up dad there who's always right with his direction and is like boom within five seconds puts it down and he's like nope changes it a little bit and he's within two degrees of north. two degrees <laughs> of actual true north yeah <laughs> But to be fair, he did drive there, so he would probably know. Well, if anyone booked the room, but also yeah. former pilot slash Boy Scout slash just really good with his. Yeah, he's always got moss growing on the side of his forehead, <laughs> so he north. knows which way north. Is. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that, and then I um, compiled all the videos, put them together, scored everybody. <clears throat> but wait, why was that your favorite tasker? That oh, because it was like even playing ground. There's no physical skill involved. There's no, mm. you know, you don't have to like conjure up some device to catch a tea bag mm. better than someone else. Mm-hmm. It's just pure <laughs> intuition. I jumped out the window and ripped an icicle that was hanging off the side of the building off and brought the icicle into the sink and then used a bat. What, did I use a yeah, battery? Yeah, you tried to fill up the sink and I tried to fill, fill up the, the icicle and with, it, with a battery and to then, then you turn the, threw the battery in and spun the battery around. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this will tell me what you know this, MacGyver. <laughs> uh, so that was fun. That was, that was fun. a fun vacation <laughs> that I enjoyed and it's still on YouTube for me to enjoy <laughs> and definitely years later. For yeah. us to enjoy as, as Christmas gifts that just keep giving. Yes. Yeah. Very fun. Yeah, you're really clever. So so uh, poverty has done wonders to your creativity, I think, because <laughs> in a previous episode, we talked about Bitcoin, and that was one of your gifts to us one Christmas was- Because I was broke. <laughs> a share of Bitcoin, a tenth of a, of a coin. And so um, a tenth of a quarter of a coin. And so, uh, and it's a gift that keeps on giving. And so these are gifts, you know, that you think of and are creative and you always make cool things for us or do things. So that was a lot of fun. And now we have these memories in our minds of like that fun time, but also, like you said, on YouTube to go back and watch um, the hosted videos for our family, which was a pretty cool gift. So thank you. Yeah. One day they might go public. I I think (laughs) mom made them public, actually. Did did she? She put them on Facebook. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, if if it's on Facebook, it's already gone. (laughs) Gone to the world. (laughs) Anyways. So yeah, that's that's my vacation story, Tim. What are you? So that was one of your most favorite, or or just yeah, most m- 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 one memorable, of your most memorable. Because yeah. uh, I have such a bad memory, but I <laughs> I did all that work, and so I remember it all. Mm-hmm. I think the um, there's a a few lessons to be gleaned from that. One is that the travel, like you said at the beginning, you've got a grotesque amount of time, and so in between working from home and and different jobs that you do it can get mundane. There's a lot of what I'm realizing in my life is people that work norm that are traditionally slaves to wage and and they they are uh, slaves to a corporation or a, a, a time clock or things like that. They, they work traditional jobs which can be good um, but it it creates this desire for a vacation that is elevated beyond what it could be or should be even. And so they live for their two weeks a year that they get, you know, in, in America, at least, you know, Europe has what they call holiday and can be different times. And of course, different companies and different roles have different um, days off and holidays and things like that. But but generally, by and large, the American workforce lives for their two weeks a year. And one is dedicated to their family. One may be dedicated to um, themselves, uh, but but they they put these on a pedestal and that is their sanctity of time. And so um, when you do that a lot, when you travel or vacation a lot, it can get so, it can get taxing in, in its own way. You know, that becomes the work. And um, and just being home and just 
you know, working a traditional job is what we long for. And so it's, it's funny to me, the irony in it to, to see that we're always longing for something on the other side of the, the fence. And it's like, wow, you, you know, we don't think how good we have it and being able to travel or do this all the time. And it's like, ah, I wish I just had a steady job, you know, that was paid me every two weeks and I could clock out at five and, you know, be in off mode or whatever. And so, um, it's just funny to, to realize the irony in that. So anyway, all of that to say, um, in your case, in this memory, what I've learned from those of us that are blessed with an abundance of um, time that we're in control of instead of an employer, it it comes down to the things that we give back to others and the way we serve others with our time, not the time we serve ourselves with. For those that live in a normal nine to five job, they go on these two vacations and those vacations are designed to serve themselves because they spend their whole year working for somebody else, serving somebody else. And so this time is, hey, it's my time to take my family to Legoland and we're going to serve ourselves and spend this amount of money and we're going to just have a blast. For those of us that are in control of more of our time, it becomes time, the value that we associate with success is the time we give back and serve others. And so, for instance, on this Long Beach trip where we got to go chop wood um, and split a quarter wood for a, a longtime missionary friend down there or something, like that's that's a highlight for me, even though the whole trip was amazing serving in that way was a highlight for me. And so in this case, it sounds like you being able to design and create and serve others by building a gift out like this and pouring so much of your time into this is a win versus had you just bought us all a gift. You know, you may not have appreciated it as much. Yeah. I mean, I've bought you all gifts before and I I don't even remember what they are. So Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But these ones you do. Yeah. So serving others. And And that's kind of the core core of the gospel anyway as a Christ followers to serve others. We we were saved and we were left here. We weren't saved and immediately raptured to heaven as as amazing as that would be. We were saved and left here. And and it's for service. Service through the encouragement of fellow believers as we walk through this life and service through bringing other believers into this life. And so um going back to the two greatest commandments and so that's it. So um so we have uh my favorite story, I, I guess one of my favorite travel memories to share. Um, oh, we have a dog barking. Yeah, you have a friend on your porch. Oh, that's exciting. An I've never friend. had that. Well, that was fun. So we just had a little um, uh, guard dog there. That was good for the listeners. Yeah, this that's is what the guard dogs are The for. blessing of uh, podcasting at home is the home studio um, comes with its pros and cons. So one of my favorite stories uh, traveling... Um, also like Steve, Sizzly Steve has been blessed with a lot of, uh, time and ability and prioritization just because I love it. It's not that my, it's not that we have any difference in time, uh, than any other human. It's that, um, when I spend money, I spend money on travel by and large versus, um, uh, my, uh, brother-in-law, for example, will spend their money on um, amazing fire pits at home or an in-ground pool or things like that. So, so we're, we all have the same amount of time and, and, uh, even resources to an extent, but my priority has always been drawn to travel and things around the world. So a lot of different stories, 40 plus countries that I've visited, um, and traveled to, I think one of the most memorable, um, was when I was stationed in the Navy on the USS George Washington. We crossed the equator for the first time, um, which is when I became a shellback uh, that first time, and that was a fun ceremony. And then we continued down to a little town uh, about, at the time, about the size of Coopville. Uh, And for those of you that don't know Coopville, we're talking like maybe one or two streets like worth a, of a Mayberry. Yeah, Mayberry, right? Um, just a cute little town uh, called Kota Kanabalu in Indonesia, and uh, you can you can Google it now. It's grown significantly since then. This was a, a decade plus ago, um, and but at the time it was this tiny little town. And I'm on the USS George Washington, which is a massive aircraft carrier, um, four thousand people. And the, um, and the fleet, 
with us that was traveling. We had two destroyers at the time, um, and maybe and and the carrier air wing was on board. So we had a lot of people that kind of <laughs> we pulled into this port and had to anchor offshore, take these little uh, Liberty boats into the uh, shore, and and of course, in, in the first two or three hours, the entire town was overwhelmed. Uh, it was drunk dry. Um, there was no more, you know, things, but one of the MWR trips that we got to go on was organized to go brown water rafting. I say brown water because the entire river was just brown from the soot, uh, from the, uh, sediment that was up in the hills in the mountains. But we had to take this train through the jungle to get there. And, looking back on it, I know how illegal this was. There's an entire scandal um, that is still under investigation through this whole process, um, which I'll get into in a minute. But at the time, I was like, wow, this is unlike anything I've ever experienced in the Navy. This is like actual wild traveling because we're we're all, there's probably 300 or 100 of us boarding this train that was designed for 50 people. And so, you know, it's packed immediately. And then we're on top of the train. We're on the front of the train. We're on the side of the train hanging on as it's carrying us through the mountains. And, and it's all government property. And we're, yeah, we're all, you know, Navy. We, we shouldn't be, they're, they're always over concerned with the briefs, you know, safety briefs and stuff like that. And yet this is a sanctioned MWR tour. It's not like we're out wandering on our own. And, um, and <laughs> we're hanging on to the side of this train and, and a tunnel comes up and we're all like, oh crap, like what's in the tunnel? Can we fit? <laughs> Should we be on the outside of the train? <laughs> and so I'm on the front of the train, hunkered down in front of the, um, I don't know what you would call it, the, I call it the bridge of the ship, but the place where the conductor stands. He can't see out the window. He's just pushing forward. The engine. The engine room. And I'm I'm like trying to hunker down as low as the, the height of the train. So that at least if there's something in the tunnel that would clip it. I know the train can get through. So theoretically I should get through, but I'm like nervous for my friends that are on the sides. And yeah, it's like, like going through space mountain with your arms up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like who knows what's, what pieces of sticks and boards or, you know, <laughs> rock is protruding. We, we make it through this tunnel just fine. And, um, we get to the other side and we, and then we, uh, go whitewater rafting in, in this sediment filled Brown river. It was a lot of fun. And I was with uh, a lot of good friends that are believers. And so we and had delicious food and we got to uh, part of that um, same tour, teach some of the kids and play soccer that were in the school. They got recessed from school and came out to play soccer with us in the field with these Americans that they never had seen before in Kota Kanabalu, um, Indonesia. And so um, it was a really cool time. Looking back on it, there's no reason we should have ever been there. I don't know of a that a carrier has been there before a carrier strike group has been there before. Um, but, uh, it was part of what is now known as the fat Leonard scandal where Francis Leonard, the head of a uh, Malaysian defense contractor, uh, would bid on services provided to the strike group, like a beer garden and trash barge and replenishment and water and stuff like that. And the farther away he could get these services and the more obscure he could, um, uh, find a port for us to pull into, the more money he would get for his services that were then required because the town couldn't support it. And so our skipper at the at the time, um, Captain uh, David Lozman, a.k.a. Too Tall, was his uh, call sign as a pilot, um, is still under investigation as, as I'm recording this podcast a decade plus later, uh, indicted m- multiple charges of um, bribery and, uh, all, all sorts of things. That, was he pocketing? Oh yeah. All yeah. Our skipper, just pocketing our money? skipper, a bunch of the, a bunch of the officers, a bunch of the, uh, Intel folks, a bunch of the, um, how does I mean, that, doesn't that money go through proper chains? No. Yeah. So the way they would do it for one example is we got off in Kota Cana blue, right? Um, as we're pulling up alongside and, and, or, I mean, as we're dropping anchor and getting ready to get on the, uh, these Liberty boats, the skipper or the, the, uh, these officers would get off and go off um, first, and there would be this big black uh, SUV waiting to pick them all up and take them up to this beautiful villa on the side of the mountain for four days. And there, it would be filled with prostitutes and you know delicious food, and that was a gift from Francis, uh, from uh, Fat Leonard to our skipper and the others for providing him intel of where the fleet was going to be in time for him to prepare that port for us with the water and the required trash barge and stuff like that. So, so it was an exchange of information and, and I'm going to pay you in, in 
um, in prostitutes or in nice accommodations or in whatever uh, for you giving me over, you know, five other contractors are bidding for this to the government to provide services for the fleet. And he always wins the bids. Why is he always winning the bids? Because he knows where we're going to be ahead of everybody else. So he can pre-station his uh, services there and and then undercut all the other contractors and say, I'm the cheapest. So because I already why know. doesn't he do that, make all his money doing that, and then also sell that information to like Russia? Oh, he, he absolutely could have, but I'm sure at that point, I mean, he may have as well, or China, but I'm sure at that point um, he's shooting himself in the foot because he's cutting, you know, if, if that is uncovered, then he's not getting continual money from us. So, you know, I, I, I don't know. I'm not privy to any of the investigation, but it's been going on for 10 plus years and, and all of these guys have been. So would you say that you are an accomplice? <laughs> no, I was, a. <laughs> we were looking back on it. I'm like, oh, that makes sense why they're all getting off in these flashy SUVs or they're all disappearing. And, you know, when you pull into a port, you've got four days and, but, but one of those days you're pulling in, you've got to come back to the ship for Liberty, but these guys would not, they'd just be off the watch bill or whatever, you know, trading, not having to stand watches or not having to do the stuff. And, and again, back to Kota Kina Blue, there's no reason a carrier should pull in there. It's not political. Most of the time we pull into a port like, um, to show presence. yeah, like Singapore, for example, to show, um, that Sing- we value Singapore as a strategic administrative region, a SAR that's independent from China's control. And we value it for its capitalism and it's a show of force and things like that. So there's political advantages to pulling into, uh, to different ports, but there's also, um, good, good well, will uh, pulling into uh, uh, partners like Australia and and doing exercises with them and their navies, but Kota Kana Blue, there, there's no military, economic or political reason that I know of that we would have ever pulled in there, and so it's just this offbeaten little town on the side of the hills uh, in a pretty area that that required the re- the reason we pulled in there. One of them was because it required all of this extra extra services that could only be provided by a defense contractor like Fat Leonard or any of the other contractors. And so he was making a lot of money by providing these services to the ship. And um, and our our chain of command was benefiting from that through that. And so so to us young enlisted at the time, uh, you know, we just were like, wow, we've never heard of this place. Cool. Oh train rides and whitewater rafting. But looking back, I'm like, oh, interesting. My my shellback certificate hanging up here on the wall is signed by him, by Captain Lawsman. And um, and he got fired and was in prison for a minute and, you know, is still under investigation. Um, so it's just a, it's an interesting story uh, as part of my <laughs> naval career. And you can, you can Google the fat learner scandal and see, you know, um, all of the continuing implications from that. But, uh, it was an interesting tour, and it, and it was a cool time to um, to be young and to to be traveling through parts of the world that I would one never know even existed, but also two, even if I knew it existed, I wouldn't pay my own money to go there, and yeah. so um, to be kind of forced into that situation and get to experience that was like, man, there are people all the way out here that will never meet an American uh, or will never know of this unless something like this happens. So in a way, you know, there's the Lord is working in all of that. And, um, and that was cool. It was, it was cool to just kind of fulfill that back to the service thing, kind of give up of our time to these elementary school kids or to, um, to come alongside and encourage my fellow brothers and sisters as we were traveling and organizing these trips. We would do a lot of that was the Lord put me in this position in a, in a rate that I knew nothing about, um, against my control and because I knew nothing about this rate, I was put in a position as um, uh, in training to learn more about this rate, but also because it was an office position, they didn't want me touching their tools and <laughs> working in the engines and the in the fuel pumps in this case. And so, uh, so it gave me a lot of time to come around and walk around and check on all of my sailors and and meet with them individually to train, but also to learn and have conversations and just always check in and as an extrovert and as a, as a, um, as a hospitality spiritual gift person, uh, the Lord obviously knew what he was doing and and put me in that position to do that and to encourage fellow believers. So every time we'd pull into a port, we already had a group of believers, uh, from all different jobs 
going out to do something like this, as opposed to everybody would get off and go drinking or do their own thing or whoring or whatever. But we would go off and do this awesome uh, community relations project, Com- Comrail or uh, MWR trip or things that would build memories and and was just a lot lot of fun and really productive. And so it was a good glory to God and a good good times. Yeah, but you didn't get any YouTube videos out of it. <laughs> That's true. I had an old, uh, uh, one of the first digital cameras, and I don't know where that is, but I have pictures on my Facebook of um, that were taken by some of the MWR folks and sold to us uh, for pennies um, of our whitewater rafting. So there's some pictures of us in this brown river sitting on the edge of the river and then diving below and getting covered in the water and coming back out and... So it was cool. Um, but that's it. So travel, yeah. that's our, that's our short for today. Um, what's your takeaway from this? We have a grotesque amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> that's not my takeaway. My takeaway is the Lord has blessed us with that time. Yeah. I know that's your takeaway too. Um, but kind of what I was saying earlier about, the grass is green on the other side. I do long for a job job, but only because of the, the ability to then justify my vacations. Like right now I, I feel guilty, which is sin in my life. Um, but, but if I worked a normal job, I could make it about me. I could say, I shouldn't feel guilty. I've worked for this. You know, I deserve these weeks. And so it's yeah, whether it's, or not that's right or wrong. Right. Exactly. So it's just easier to mentally, justify that but again that's that's something in my life I'm working through and um and the sin of that 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 comes with greed or or pride or ego or whatever so but for those of you listening this would be a good place to ask the rhetorical question for your life where do you where do you find your value and your why why are you working in the job that you're working in as a stay-at-home mom, a stay-at-home dad, is working out in the world and whatever you do, why are you doing that? What is your end goal and purpose? What do you find your justification in? If it's something of the world that will not last, is it something that will last? So we'll leave you with that. Thank you again for listening to another episode of the Anna Vivo podcast. And as my kids would say, thanks for Thank you for listening to another episode of the Anna Vivo podcast. We welcome your feedback and ideas. You can learn more about us by simply Googling the word Anna Vivo. This podcast is supported by listeners like you. I am a licensed real estate broker with Compass Real Estate and a nationwide real estate matchmaker. We consult with you for free, find and vet the right real estate professional that specializes in the area and niche you need, are paid by that professional, and they get clients like yourself who want and need their unique specialty or winning track record. If you or someone you know is in the market to buy or sell real estate anywhere in the U.S., don't simply web search the highest paying advertiser. Let us use our licensed experience to find and vet the real and best professional for you. It costs you nothing but a phone call or email with me and it saved my clients financially and emotionally. I'd be honored to serve And you can reach me direct by email at tim.c.miller at outlook.com. And as always, to God be the glory.